You know, the relationship uh, between bosses and employees can kind of be fodder for all kinds of jokes, and some of those jokes aren't so funny, especially if you're the boss, right? I heard about a boss who put a sign on the company bulletin board that announced, to err is human, to forgive is not company policy. <laughs> heard about another boss who put a sign, you've probably seen this one, rule number one, the boss is always right. Rule number two, if you think the boss is wrong, refer to rule number one. A man called the worst boss, the world's worst boss, or the world's grumpiest boss, died back in 2016. Uh, Mike Davis was his name, a.k.a. Tiger Mike. He started out as a chauffeur, but he worked his way all the way up in the 1970s to become a Houston oil and gas magnet. Throughout his career he would issue these grumpy memos to his employees. For instance, on one occasion, he sent this memo. Idle conversation and gossip in this office among employees will result in immediate termination. Do your jobs and keep your mouth shut. And then about a month later, he sent this one. There will be no more birthday celebrations, birthday cakes, levity, or celebrations of any kind within the office. This is a business office. If you have to celebrate, do it after office hours on your own time. Well, the vast majority of people work for a boss, right? And many of those bosses may not be easy to work for. And so for the Christian, the question becomes, how do I conduct myself when I have a very difficult boss? So as you know, our sermon series here in 1 Timothy, Paul left Timothy there in Ephesus to try to deal with some of the problems in the church, some of the problems that those Christians were facing. And so he gave them instructions on how to deal with false teachers and their false teaching. He also gave him instructions on how to deal with different people in the church and, and how to show proper respect for widows or for elders. We talked about those things here recently. But in the section we're going to study today, Paul turns his attention to this other kind of social relationship, and that is a relationship between servants and their masters. Now, had you or I lived... In the Roman-dominated world of that first century, there's a real good chance that you or I would have been one of the slaves. Estimates are that there were 60 million slaves living in the Roman Empire, and that was about half the population. So there's a good chance that you or I would be considered a slave. Now, let's briefly define some of the terms. Let's start with the word slave. So the Greek word for slave or bond servant is doulos. And it can be translated as servant, slave, or bondservant. And it means a person who is legally owned by someone else and whose entire livelihood and purpose was determined by his or her master. Now, as you know, slavery in the United States of America was a, a, an awful, evil, sinful institution, thankfully, that was put aside. But slavery in Paul's day was different from the slavery that existed in our country in the past. Slaves in Paul's day were accorded some of the same social status even of their owners. And so with all outward appearances, you wouldn't even necessarily know, looking around an audience of a church like this, who were considered the slaves and who were not considered the slaves because they didn't look much different from each other, right? In many cases, slavery was preferred to freedom because of the security that it offered a person. One commentator said it this way. A slave could be a custodian, a merchant, a CEO, even a government official. Many slaves live separate from their owners. And selling oneself into slavery was commonly used as a means for gaining Roman citizenship. Or gaining entrance into society. So Roman slavery in the first century was far more humane and civilized than the American African slavery practiced in this country during the 17th and 19th centuries. 
Whereas 19th century slavery was tragically racist, theirs was mainly and rarely racist, uh, rarely racist, rather, and, and reflected the economic and political realities of the ancient culture, unquote. So, so theirs was a different idea of, of what slavery meant than, than the word we have in our minds. So the Greek word, though, for masters, uh, despotes, is where we get that English word despot from, right? But unlike the English use of that word, the Greek term doesn't carry the connotation of someone who's harsh or cruel or abusive. Rather, it merely was a person who had general authority over others, whether they be slaves or subjects, often as an owner as well as an authority figure. And actually, this word, despotes, was actually used of Jesus. He is our master. He's our master. So in Greek culture and terminology, doulos and depotes, servants and masters went together. And although we're not living in the master-slave system today, we all have to deal with authority figures in our lives. Whether they're government officials and we're citizens or whether it's the teacher-student relationship, or whether it's the employer-employee relationship, or parent-child relationship, or even husband-and-wife relationship. Each of us, regardless of our occupation, regardless of our place in life, is under someone's authority. And ultimately, we all live under God's authority, right? So living under the spiritual authority of God means that we learn to live under the earthly authorities that God has put over us. So let's talk for a minute about a realistic assessment of authority. So before we get into what Paul writes to Timothy and to the church there at Ephesus, let's just think about some of the challenges that we face when it comes to the subject of authority and submission. First of all, submitting to authority is not a natural trait. Now, can I get an amen on that, right? Okay, you can relate to that, right? That's not some strange idea to you, right? As sinful people, we prefer rebellion over submission. Rebellion's a whole lot more fun, right? Rebellion has many uh, adventurous things about it. It's much more self-gratifying to be rebellious than to be submissive. Being our own boss, we think, is much better than having someone else as our boss. So submission is much harder than rebellion. And our first choice is often rebellion rather than submission. That's just a reality, right? Secondly, though, struggles with authority are sometimes complex. You know, some of us resist authority because we want to be in control. Whereas other people resist authority because they have different reasons. Maybe they've been in an abusive relationship under the authority of someone. And so you can see how that would be a different dynamic and create a, a different kind of response rather than it just being I'm kind of rebellious and I like to do my own thing to this is a very destructive pattern and a difficult thing. So, so the person abusing them could have been a parent, could have been a teacher, some other authority figure in their lives. But understanding the hurt and the confusion is going to be able to help us if that's our problem, if that's the difficulty we face, it's going to help us to understand how to then live under the authority figures that God's put in our life. Because in the end, obedience to God is still the final order, right? The final command. We must submit to the authorities in our life, including, and most importantly, God. Number three, though, some in authority have not earned our respect. And this is just a reality in life, right? Some of the people who are in authority over us have not earned our respect and may never earn our respect. A private in the army, we've got a few military people among us, may serve under a captain who has no integrity. But if they're wise and submissive, they'll salute the uniform when it goes by, even if they can't respect the person wearing it, right? Or 
the student may have a teacher that doesn't really like them and mistreats them or plays favorites in the classroom, but a wise and submissive student is going to do their best to obey and to not give the teacher ammunition to use against them, right? This is just one of those realities. The command to obey authorities is not tied to how deserving they are. Oh, you obey if they're really good and respectable people. No, they have a position, and we have to obey them because they're in that position. But then number four, to contrast that, right, resisting authority is not always wrong. So being submissive to God and submissive to the authorities around us doesn't mean we check our brains at the door or our own will at the door necessarily. Now, Christians should be wary of anyone who demands, follow me no matter what. We only give that right to God, right? And so if denying God's moral standards or breaking one of God's commands is the thing being ordered by an earthly authority, we must, like Peter, stand up and say, I have to obey God over humans. Um, like Peter did there in, in, in Acts 5 and verse 29. So in this brief, realistic assessment of authority, we see that submission's not natural, it's not easy, and there are those who make it harder for us to be submissive to them because they lack integrity. But in the end, we must learn to submit to authority because God says so. So, number two, let's move into this, a religious commandment concerning authority. In our verses here from 1 Timothy, we notice that Paul presents God's commands about our response to authority, and, and it's kind of broken into three types of authority that we might find ourselves under. The first, let's notice how Christians should act when it's non-Christians who are in authority over us. So there in verse 1, Paul said, All who are under the yoke as slaves should regard their own masters as worthy of all respect so that God's name and his teaching will not be blasphemed. Now, it's interesting that Paul would use the term yoke of slavery because it brings to mind the idea of yoked animals. And, uh, you know, many of us, who work in different kinds of jobs feel sometimes like a yoked animal, you know. We're, we're doing the, the heavy work or the, the hard work, and, and, and slaves did that kind of stuff for sure. From the most menial of tasks to even working as tutors with children. So there were many different ways they were, they were used, but they often were thought of as tools or technology to get the job done. Now, as I said earlier, slavery was mostly economically motivated rather than racially motivated in that day. And in spite of how different life might be for the master or the slave in that Roman context, Paul instructed Christian slaves to honor, respect their masters. They, they owed their master something. And interesting, if you've been following in our series, this same word keeps popping up, right? Honor the widows among you. Honor the elders who are worthy of respect. And, and we saw how that honor included you owing them something. It might be financial support, right? So that's some of those concepts that have been going on. In this case, you owe the master an economic follow-through with, with your job. So... Paul isn't trying to say the Christian slaves had to bind to everything their non-Christian masters believed or practiced, but they were to treat their masters with respect and to work hard for them. So why didn't Paul just suggest that Christian slaves cast off their slavery and, and, and rebel against the whole system and, and just go do whatever they wanted to do? Paul believed the best way for Christianity to change the world wherever needed changing was by the demonstration of a superior life. 
It was going to be the Christian's life influence, not their insubordination, that was going to change the empire or their non-Christian master or whoever it was. The most important thing, though, was that God's name and his teachings would be held in high esteem. That they would not be blasphemed or in any way harmed by the slave's behavior. So let's try to apply this for a second to today's business environment. Christians are scattered throughout all kinds of of the marketplace, right? Many Christians work for non-Christian employers or managers. And some of these people in authority are people of integrity and some are not. Some are bad-tempered. Some are partial to their favorite employees. And there are some that are going to even make it harder on the Christian employee because they're a non-Christian and they don't like Christianity. So what's the message? Regardless of their attitude towards us as Christians, Paul says we should honor them by doing our very best in our job. And and let's keep in mind that the workplace shouldn't be a place for aggressive or nonstop evangelism, okay? You're you're in a secular setting. You're hired to do a secular job. Yes, you can share a testimony and, 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 and try to be a light for Christ, but you're not there to evangelize. Ultimately, you're being paid to do a job, and we need to do that job and not take advantage of the job. I believe that being the best at the job, doing our best in the workplace, is going to open more opportunities for evangelism than doing otherwise. So we have to keep that in mind. So how do you deal with a non-Christian employer? You do your best. You treat them with respect. The next category, though, that, that Paul addresses is how Christians should act when Christians are in authority over us. What if your boss is a Christian? And maybe you've been in that situation. Maybe you work for a Christian uh, agency. But if not, maybe it's a secular agency, but your superior happens to be a fellow believer. Paul said, let those who have believing masters not be disrespectful to them because they're brothers, but serve them even better. Since those who benefit from their service are believers and dearly loved, teach and encourage these things. So if if your boss is a Christian, that means you don't have to work as hard, right? That means you can relax and productivity can go down. You can say, hey, hey, we're brothers. We're on the same level at the foot of the cross. So don't take this boss thing too too seriously, right? Don't let it go to your head. That's what Paul says, right? No. He says the opposite. Just because you're brothers and sisters in Christ doesn't mean you get to take advantage of that. He said you should serve your Christian superior even better because they're a brother or a sister, right? So whether we get a paycheck from a Christian organization or a secular one, we shouldn't take advantage of Christian superiors just because we're members of the same family. Now, hopefully, if our Christian, uh, if our boss is a Christian, hopefully they'll be a person of integrity. And hopefully they'll treat us with greater respect than maybe some secular boss would. Hopefully they'll do that. But we can't take advantage of that. I can come in late because they're a Christian and they'll look the other way. They understand, you know. No, we can't, we can't act that way, right? So the Christian should work harder and better, not lighter or less productively for a Christian boss. Number three, though, we, Paul turns his attention. How should a Christian act because God's word is in authority over us? So that's... That's the authority that Paul addresses next is the word of God as authority. So Paul exhorted Timothy at the end of verse 2, these are the things you should teach. You should remind them that we're all under the authority of God. And then he continued in verse 3, if anyone teaches false doctrine, 
that does not agree with sound teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the teaching that promotes godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing but has an unhealthy interest in disputes or arguments over words. From these come envy and quarreling and slander and evil suspicions, a constant disagreement among people whose minds are depraved and deprived of the truth, who imagine that godliness is a way to material gain. So Paul, for Paul, the test of a teacher, preacher, or any disciple, the test is, are they living under the submission of the Word of God? And if they're not living in submission to the word of God, then they are ultimately a false teacher. They're heading in the wrong direction, right? And so Isaiah the prophet said in Isaiah 8 and 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. So the word is, 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 is the authority. And if any of us, are not living in submission to it or teaching someone something contrary to it, there's no light of dawn in us. We're in darkness. And so if a person doesn't stay with what Jesus taught, they're a false teacher. He, he further categorized them as conceited. If you think you know more than God knows, then you obviously have a wrong idea about who God is, right? And, and who you are, right? So he says that the, the person who doesn't live in submission to the commands and word of God is conceited. They're full of themselves. They think they know better than God. And they therefore have an unhealthy interest in controversies or quarrels. So rather than focusing on the simple truths of Christianity and living them out and living in submission to them, these false teachers wasted their efforts on speculations, which result in envy and strife and division. And the false teacher's motive, Paul says, is for some kind of personal gain. And that's often the case, right? Whether it be cash or whether it be control or whether it just be selfishness. Why are you not submitting to the word of God? Because you think you get more by not. Or you think you'll gather a greater crowd. And so the pastoral letters of Paul are quite clear that the laborer certainly is worthy of their hire. So if he's applying this to those teachers who are being supported for their work, there's a place for that. But it's public service, not personal gain, that any preacher or teacher should be, should be seeking. Um, so let's kind of wrap this up with, with the third thing, the, the, the righteous commitment to living under authority. All right. Let's try to summarize what we've learned here at, by, by applying it and, and, and emphasizing the application. So first of all, if we have a non-Christian superior, let's leave that person no room to question our faith. So again, that doesn't mean we agree with everything that they think or do or whatever, because there may be some serious disagreements if they're a non-Christian and you're a Christian. But let's live and work in a way that honors Christ, whether we're talking in the workplace or whether we're talking in school or, or whether we're talking in the home or in the church. Let's do our assignments well. Let's respect everyone that's around us. Let's not give anyone the opportunity to say, see, I knew that all Christians are hypocrites. And isn't that often what the non-Christians around us are looking for? Some way to say, see, I knew it. They're just as bad as me. They're no better than me. I don't have to believe and become a Christian because they're bad too, right? We don't want to give them that opportunity. The best way to have spiritual impact on a non-Christian, whether it's a boss or a non-Christian spouse or parent, is through holy living, respectful, trustworthy, not quoting scripture, but living the scripture. Now, let's be sure we keep our spiritual fires stoked because when we find ourselves in a very non-Christian environment, it's easy for, for the fire of God to go out, right? 
So that means we need times like this when we come back together and get re-energized and, and strengthened through worship and fellowship. Of course, personal Bible study and devotion. But let's keep the spiritual fires going because it's hard to live for Christ in a difficult non-Christian environment at school or the workplace or even in a non-Christian home setting, right? But secondly, if we have a Christian superior, let's refuse to take unfair advantage. And we, we hit this pretty hard there as we were talking about it. We should work hard and be sure to serve the Christian superior as well as we can, not expecting special treatment simply because we're both Christians. But whether our boss is Christian or non-Christian, we have to always keep in mind, who is the ultimate boss? And the ultimate boss is God. He's my boss. He's my boss's boss in the end. And that in the end, I'm really trying to please that boss, the heavenly one, even more so than the earthly ones. And then number three, living under the authority of scriptures means going beyond mere discussion to application. Now, this isn't a call to avoid any kind of hard study or or thoughtful reflection or discussion of Scripture, even on the most difficult of topics. But let's realize we can spend years analyzing difficult questions or even some of the simple ones. We could spend years in 1 Corinthians 13 trying to understand all the ins and outs of what love is and never get around to trying to put any of it into practice. We need to avoid that, right? We can spend years of endless speculation on all kinds of subjects and fail to live and to share the simple basics of Christianity. Love, holiness, service, humility. Not a lot of big questions about those things. What does God demand from us? To explain all the mysteries of the Bible? No, not necessarily, right? But to love Him and obey Him, and to love our neighbors ourselves, right? The two biggest commands. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And another one of the simple basics that comes out in this text is the submission to authorities in our lives. To putting aside rebelliousness, which comes naturally, and to submit ourselves to the authorities in our lives, humbly submitting ourselves first and foremost to God and His Word, right? So, there is no sphere of life without authority. At the office, the school, the church, the home, the community, they all have authority structures in place, and we have to learn to live under them. It's not a question of whether we like the rules or don't like the rules. Ultimately, if the rules don't go against what God has said... And we must submit ourselves to the rules that are above us, right? But it begins with bringing our lives under the authority of God and God's word. And then everything else revolves around that. God's word is the last word. It is the authority, right? So let me ask you, have you put yourself under the authority of Jesus, who is the Savior but he's also the Lord, the master. 